Thank you. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Moberly. How are you guys doing today? Good morning, Moberly. (laughs) Got to get you guys awake. Hey, listen, the sun's out. Uh, The rain's passed for the week, at least. And uh, we have a lot to uh, smile about, a lot to be happy about this morning. And it's really, I'm encouraged to get to be with you this morning. I'm really uh, praying for Pastor Jeffrey. I'm really sorry that he's not able to be with you this morning. And I know that he had looked forward to this. So we want to continue to pray for his healing and restoration. Um, But it is good to get to reconnect. Some of you I recognize and some of you I don't recognize. But Tina and I had the joy of serving here uh, during kind of an interim period when we were still at the convention center. And uh, I was thinking about this morning, it's so nice not to have to get up so early and come over and set everything up uh, because God's given you a beautiful facility now and a beautiful place to meet. And it's been such a great blessing. I was really, uh, can remember, Jill, when uh, you were in Longview and then went to South Dakota, or South, yeah, yeah South Dakota, uh, and then uh, contacting Jeffrey about, hey, would you pray about coming back to East Texas and being the campus pastor at Moberly, and it's been such a joy to see how God has brought you all back, what he's done through you, and you've got such a great shepherd leading you here, and Marshall, and I love him, he's my friend, and I'm praying that he'll get to feeling better. Well, his plan was to preach the same passage that uh, Pastor Andrew is preaching on our Longview campus, and that's Philemon. Uh, Next week, y'all will be going to Haggai for a series out of the Old Testament, and I've uh, been so blessed to uh, be able to walk through the book of Colossians just recently. And we're uh, going to look at Philemon today. Uh, and thanks to the help of Pastor Andrew's notes and outline, uh, I'm looking forward to getting to share this passage with you today. And I just want to invite you even now to open your Bibles or your electronic device to Philemon. It's uh, after all the epistles, uh, so First and Second Timothy, First and Second Thessalonians, and then Titus and Philemon, right before Hebrews. And it's just a very, very short book, but it's got a powerful message for us today. Tina and I don't watch tons of TV series, but one that we did get pretty interested in a few years ago was called The Crown. And it was very intriguing as you sort of had this inside look on the family, the royal family. And, of course, we had known the characters because we heard about them in the news here and there. But to sort of kind of see the inner workings and seeing how they related or they didn't relate together was really fascinating. And recently, uh, Prince Harry has a new book called Spare. Uh, In that book, the title comes from the fact that when his father had his first son, he says, God's given me an heir. And then when Prince Henry was born, he says, now I have a spare. Bear. And that title itself says something, doesn't it, about the relationship that Henry's had with his family. And in this book, he's very open and he's very transparent. And he talks about all of the drama, all the hurt feelings, um, the, the family brokenness that he experienced growing up in his family. And none of us would want our child to grow up and write a book like this, right? About our family and all the stuff that we went through. But it's out. It's in the public. And he's had a lot of interviews about the book. And many times the interviewer will ask him the question, well, Prince Harry, after kind of spilling the tea uh, uh, all over the place, uh, sharing all this information, do you think there's any possibility that you will ever experience forgiveness and reconciliation with your family? And maybe that's the question that you're asking about a relationship in your life. While this is a very public example of brokenness and hurt, it's not an alone example, is it? Of brokenness and hurt and disruption of relationships. In fact, we see it every day. We see it uh, in our workplace. We see it in families. We see it in governments. And sadly, we even see it in the church, don't we? There's times that we experience hurt and pain and a disruption of our relationship. But this is the good news, and this is the title today, The Gospel Can Fix Anything. That's the power of the gospel. And the gospel works most powerfully when life is messed up, when life is broken That's where the gospel shows up. That's where the gospel does its work. Uh, Last August, Tina and I got to travel to Montana for a conference called uh, Peace Sewing, or Sewing Peace, I think was the title of it. 
And it was led by an author named Ken Sandy. Ken Sandy wrote a book about 20 years ago called The Peacekeeper. And his whole premise is God bringing peace to our relationships. Relational peace in the family, relational peace in friendships, relational peace in the church, relational peace in the workplace. And it's just a very powerful thing. But they introduced something to me I'd never heard of before, but I find very intriguing. And it's called Kintsugi. Kintsugi. It's a Japanese word. And it's about a Japanese art. And as you see the picture on the uh, screen this morning, kintsugi is when they take broken pottery or a broken vessel and they put it back together using precious metals like gold or silver or bronze. Most commonly, it's gold. And uh, in fact, the word itself, kin, means gold and sugi means to put back together. So it's taking this precious and something that was broken and ugly and not usable is not only put together to be usable again, but now it's also very beautiful. Uh, the metaphor is this, that uh, when we are broken, we can heal and become stronger and wiser and more beautiful after we mend. We have more valuable life with the knowledge that we've gained by our experience, and we actually become better than before. And rather than living a bitter life, we can live a, a better life. Because of God's healing and God's brokenness. So the gospel is good news. God restores broken things. God makes uh, beauty from brokenness. We sang that this morning, that he makes beauty out of our ashes. So the things in our life that are the ugliest and the most broken and the, the, just the, the things that seem to have no value, God can make valuable again. God can put back together again. And God can make it better than it ever was before. Reconciliation is an accounting term. And this story in Philemon is a whole story. It's a book about reconciliation. It's a, it's a book about how God restores brokenness, how he brings people back together. And did you know as a church, we should be a community of reconciliation. We should be known for this all the time. But some of you will remember this, and a few of you won't remember this, but uh, when I first learned about banking and I got my first checkbook, how many of you even have a checkbook these days? Yeah, about half of you. Uh, most of you, you just do your banking right here, don't you, on your phone. But, but we had a checkbook, and we would write checks, and then every month we would get a statement called your bank statement, right? And when you get your bank statement, most of you don't get those anymore, it's just all electronic, but you would take your bank statement, you would take your checkbook, and you would see if they added up together. So if the amount was different in your checkbook than what was on your bank statement, you started doing some uh, accounting, right? Because you wanted them to come in line, especially if your bank account said you had less money than your checkbook had, right? You're like, uh-oh, where did that go? That's why I always use duplicate checks, because if I forgot to write it down, I could find out where I'd actually spent something I didn't know I spent something. But sometimes we're at odds with one another. Sometimes things aren't adding up in our relationship. Sometimes we aren't getting along. We're not seeing eye to eye. And reconciliation is what God first does for us through Jesus Christ in our relationship with him. But it's also what God does through us in our relationship that we have with one another. Philemon is about this. So in the book of Philemon, he's writing to a church. It's meeting in the home of Philemon. Philemon is a very wealthy slave owner. He, obviously, he probably has a, a very adequate house because his house is big enough for the church to gather in. We'll see later that Paul actually tells him to reserve a room for him. So Philemon's very wealthy, but Philemon had come to know Jesus. His life had been changed. And then we see a second character here, and his name is Onesimus. Now, say that five times fast. Onesimus. Uh, some of you that might be expecting or someone, you know, the, there's a name to consider right there for, for a boy, Onesimus. And so Onesimus was apparently a slave of Philemon, and he had escaped, probably had actually taken some valuable things for Philemon, but in God's providence, he ended up in Rome. Colossae and Rome are not next-door neighbors. In fact, there's a body of water between them, so that's not like an easy journey, but in God's providence, he had come to Rome. Paul's in prison under house arrest. He meets Paul, and he comes to have a relationship 
with Christ through Paul. Now let's talk about slavery for just a minute, the social impact that it had on this culture. It's estimated that a third of the population of Rome were slaves. That would be about 2 million slaves. And if you expand that out to the Roman Empire, there were likely about 60 million slaves in the entire Roman Empire. These were men and women who were treated like pieces of merchandise to be bought and to be sold. Some slaves were captured in war and they were sent back to Rome where they would live out the rest of their life serving the wealthy Romans. Some made themselves slaves because of their life situation and the hopelessness of their situation. They would voluntarily, they would say, I want to be an indentured servant. I want to be a bond servant because my life will actually be better being a slave to you than I would be on the streets in my current life condition. Some slave owners were very uh, caring and very uh, considerate of their slaves. Some were very harsh. But it was actually a very valuable thing for slave owners to have slaves. In fact, the average slave sold for about 500 denarii. A denarii was one day's wages. So it would take a whole year, more than a year's wages, to buy one slave. And that was the average. Some educated and very skilled slaves sold for a price of 50,000 denarii. That's a century worth of work, y'all. A century worth of wages. So you can see the, the value that came with these slaves. Some slave owners had as many as 400 slaves at one time. And as we said, some treated them well, some treated them with violence, and they were alienated, and they knew nothing but dishonor and shame. But for a slave owner to be seen in public with their slaves was a sign of status. It was displaying their wealth. It was kind of like they were wearing their Rolex and shining it out for everyone. They were flaunting it. That was kind of the, the social thing that they had with having slaves. So it would be very costly it would also be very embarrassing, publicly embarrassing, for a slave to have a owner to have a slave run off, and um, and that's what happened here. In fact, the punishment for a runaway slave would either be branding; they would brand the letter F on the forehead of the slave, which is fugitivus; it means a fugitive, or CF, which is cave furum, which would be beware of the thief. Or, in many cases, it would be death by crucifixion, the worst form of death that was known at this time. It said that once a man had 400 slaves, and one of the slaves killed the owner, the punishment was the execution of all 400 slaves. So you get a little feel for what's happening here. For Onesimus to receive justice would mean that at the least he would be branded for life or, more likely, he would lose his life. But Paul instead is pleading for mercy. And even more than mercy, he is pleading for reconciliation. He is appealing that Philemon would not just forgive him of his crime, of his leaving, of his uh, stealing, but he's asking him to restore Philemon, to bring Philemon back and restore him. And listen to this, not just as a slave, but now as a brother, as part of his own family. And Paul's not demanding this. He's not saying you have to do it. But he's saying, basically, Philemon, because of our faith, because of what we have experienced in Jesus Christ, because we have received this kind of treatment, we as sinners have been forgiven. And we've not just been forgiven, we have been brought into the family of God. So he's saying, Philemon, I want you to do the right thing, not based on law, not based on the rights you have as a slave owner in Rome, but based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. One commentator called this a little bit of grace-filled arm-twisting. Uh, I heard Pastor Andrews, I was driving over, I just kind of wanted to hear him, and he 
He said, according to the Andrew version, it would be uh, like buttering him up a little bit uh, for what he's about to ask him. But he's, he's literally reminding him of the things that he has received. So this morning, I want us to look at three things. First of all, the appeal for reconciliation that Paul makes. And then we're going to look at the admonitions about reconciliation And then we'll conclude with a few conclusions or observations about reconciliation and the Christian life that God's given us to live. So let's look first at this appeal for reconciliation. And let's skip down to verse 8. In fact, let me start with verses 1 through 3 because I meant to read that earlier. I want to set the setting here. We see it's Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. We see in two things here. Paul was not an independent operator. Paul valued team. Paul valued relationships. It wasn't a one-man show for Paul ever. He partnered with Timothy. He partnered here now with Philemon. He calls him a friend. And then he said to beloved Athia. This is probably Philemon's wife. And then Archippus, our fellow soldier, probably uh, maybe a, a servant in the church, And he says, to the church that meets in your house, Philemon. So Philemon is hosting the church. And then let's go down to verse 8 where we see this appeal. He says, therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you for what is fitting, for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged and now a prisoner. There's a little bit more of that grace field arm twisting. He's like, look, I'm old. (laughs) And I'm in prison, and I'm making this appeal to you. Uh, And he goes on to say, for my, he says, I appeal to you, in verse 10, for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. In a minute, we're going to see what he's appealing for Onesimus, or for Philemon to do for Onesimus, but for for a few minutes, I want us to look at the reasons he gives to make this appeal. And the first one is Philemon's reputation. We go back up to verse 4, and we read that he says, I thank my God, he's thinking about Philemon now, making mention of you always in my prayers. He's been praying for Philemon as the host of the church, a leader in the church. But he also says, but I've heard of your love and your faith. Philemon, you're not just a slave owner. You are a follower of Jesus, and you know the love of Christ, and you have demonstrated the faith of Christ. And he said, you have shown this toward the Lord, but you've also shown it toward the saints, towards the people that know you, the people who work for you, the people in your family, the people in the community. You've shown them this love. you, You have a reputation that you follow Jesus. And that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. He says, Philemon, don't forget, remember what you have as a follower, as a son, as a child of Jesus Christ. The forgiveness you have, the life you have. And then he goes on to say, for we have great joy and consolation in your love Because the hearts, listen to this, the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. In other words, Philemon, you've lived a life, you've served in a way that people around you feel encouraged. They feel refreshed. They feel life. And so he's appealing to him and and he's saying, I know I'm going to ask you to do a difficult thing, but it's in keeping, it's in line with the person I know you to be. I've seen it. I've witnessed it in your life. It will require love, it will require faith, and it's going to refresh my heart. But then the second reason he appeals, he says, is Onesimus. It's about what's happened in Onesimus, his conversion and his transfer, transformation. Notice the second part of verse 10, where he said, I have begotten, whom I have begotten while in my chains. Onesimus is now become a follower of Jesus. He's not just an escaped slave to Paul. He's actually become his brother, his son. And then notice what he says, who was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. He says, I'm sending him back to you. Therefore, receive him that is my own heart. 
That's pretty powerful. He's saying, when you receive Onesimus, you're receiving part of me because I have invested my life in him. I have seen him. You are receiving my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on behalf, your behalf, he might minister to me and my chains and for the gospel. Let's kind of look at this in some, some things that we see that has happened in Onesimus. When Onesimus left, Philemon knew him as a thief and as a runaway slave. And you can imagine that Philemon, knowing that, would not have a lot of regard for this person. But Paul is saying Onesimus is a different person. In verse 10, he's, a, he's my child. He, he, he was birthed actually in prison. And he has experienced the spiritual birth. So he's actually now a follower of Jesus. He's not just a slave. He's, he's a follower. He's my son. Notice what he said in verse 11. He was once useless. And there's a play on words here because the word Onesimus means to be useful, to be valuable. And Onesimus up to this point wasn't living up to his name because he was not very valuable to Philemon. He was known as a thief. But he's saying now he is. He's actually served you under obligation, but he's serving me freely. He, he serves because, he's, because he wants to serve now. He's not serving because he has to serve, but because of what God's done in his heart, he's serving. He's useful to you and to me. He's a servant of Paul in verses 13 and 14, and he describes this, uh, how he uh, has, has been such a blessing to him. And he's saying now, Philemon... You should be willing to serve because of how I've invested in you, the relationship. But now you get the opportunity to do a good deed freely. And then the final thing he says, and this is verses 15 and 16. He says, now he's a brother in Christ. In Christ, slaves become sons. Those who were alienated become his family. Notice what it says. He says, for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose that you might receive him forever. Yeah, he could be a slave for you for life, but guess what? Now you've got a brother forever. There's, there's a big change that's taking place here. And, um, and now he was alienated, but he could be part of your family. That's the story that we've experienced, right? As followers of Jesus, we were alienated. We were hopeless we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We had no right to be with God. We had no hope of being with God. But because of the cross, because of the gospel, we are His very sons and daughters now. We are no longer slaves. We're sons. And so this is such an amazing story. Don't you think this would make an interesting movie? Uh, this plot of these two people and what's happened here. I mean, just think about it. You know, Onesimus escapes from Colossae. Somehow, he gets connected to Paul. How did that happen? Well, we don't know. It's not told us, but maybe someone said, Hey, Onesimus, you escaped. There's this guy in prison named Paul that's been teaching us about the love of God. You probably need that. You ought to meet him. I don't know if that's how it happened. But all I do know is somehow Paul, who knows Onesimus, left his friend, stole from his friend, doesn't reject him. He doesn't say, Hey, I don't have time for you, Onesimus. I know what kind of character you are, but what does Paul do? Paul says, hey, Anesimus, come on, let me tell you something. Let me tell you about what's happened in my life. You see, once I was a murderer. I, I was a persecutor. Once I hated the gospel, but then I met Jesus, and guess what's happened in my life? And then Onesimus meets him. And so now Paul is, you know, here's the twist. Now Paul's saying, you know what, Anesimus? You're going to be reconciled. I, I'm praying and I'm going to appeal that you be reconciled to the person that you stole from, your owner. So we see this appeal, but then we see a shift in verses 17 through 20. And we see that now from appeal, it's gone to an admonition. There are no imperatives in those first 16 verses. But when we get to verse 17, there's three imperatives, and they're like rapid-fire imperatives. Those are commands. He's, he's saying, Anesimus, I'm asking you, I'm, I'm commanding you to do these three things, and there's actually a fourth one in verse 22. And so let's, um, let's look at these. 
and uh, see how this appeal moves to admonition. The first one, he says, a Philemon? It's hard to get these two names straight, isn't it? <laughs> Philemon, I want you to accept him, Onesimus, just like you would accept me. See what he says in verse 17? He says, if then you count me as a partner, receive him, Onesimus, just like you would receive me if I came to visit you. Forgiveness is more, he's asking for more than forgiveness here. Sometimes we will forgive someone, but we aren't ready to invite them into our circle of friendship or our family. But what he's saying to here is, Philemon, I'm not only asking that you dismiss what he did, but receive him into your family. Receive him into your relationship. Receive him into your life. It says receive him in the English standard in the New King James. And then the New American says accept him. And that's such an opposite of rejecting. We've all experienced rejection, haven't we? We've not fit. We've not been accepted. We've not been welcomed in certain situations. And when it hurts the most is when it's by those who we thought loved us or those who we've experienced love before. And he's saying now to Philemon, as in, the, in the Christian standard says it this way, welcome him into your family circle. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a slave who stole from you coming back and you saying, hey, come on and sit at my table. Come on, meet my family. Come on, I want to have a relationship with you. That's what he's asking him to do. Would you be willing to welcome into your home someone who had hurt you greatly, maybe stolen from you, hurt you verbally? He says to welcome him. And this is the picture of the first big word I'm going to give you this morning. I'm only going to give you two big words this morning because I don't know a lot of big words. But it's a good word to, to catch hold of. This is describing substitutionary atonement. And what that means is, as those who have sinned against a holy God, we are able to receive the righteousness of Christ. Not because we deserve it, not because we could earn it, not because we could do anything to gain it, but because God in His great love gave His Son Jesus who paid for our sins. He took our place. He stood in for us and took our punishment. And therefore, we're welcomed now by a father as if we have the very righteousness of Christ. And he's appealing to him on this basis, saying, Anisimus or Philemon, because you've been accepted, because you've been forgiven, you have the capacity to accept one who has sinned against you. But notice the second thing he says. The second imperative is verses 18 and 19. He says, charge what he owes to my account. We assume, we believe that he stole. So he says in verse 18, if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. He's not, he's not saying that it's okay that it was stolen. He goes, I'm going to pay for it. He, and then he goes on to say, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. Like, this is not some secondhand thing that you're hearing. This is from me. This is from Paul, and I love you. Not to mention that you owe, owe me even your own self besides. So he's saying, Philemon, you owe me because of all that you received and the teaching and the encouragement. But you know what? Even though you owe me, I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay for what Philemon did. And that, again, is the picture of the gospel, isn't it? It's, it's the picture that we owed a debt that we could not Pay, y'all are better than the first service. There's three of you that said it. And he paid a debt we did not Oh, All right, you're getting away. Let's say again. We owed a debt we could not. And he paid a debt that he did not Oh, That's what Christ did for us. You see, it takes more than love to solve a problem. 
God loves the whole world, and yet the whole world is not saved by his love. The whole world is saved because of his grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace, unmerited favor, God's gift. I like the way Warren Worsby said this. He said that grace is love that pays a price. For by grace we've been saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works. We can't boast about this. We have nothing to do with this. But we're saved by grace. It's a gift of God. God in His holiness could not ignore. He could not just look the other way and pretend that we had not sinned. That we had not offended His holiness. But what He did do is He paid for it Himself. We owed a debt that we couldn't pay. He paid a a debt that we couldn't. You ready for the second big word? It's the doctrine of imputation. Impute means to put to an account or to put on account. And so what that means is when Jesus died on a cross, my sins were put on his account. And he was treated the way that I should have been treated. And when I trusted him as the one who died for me, and I surrendered to him as my Savior and Lord, his righteousness was put on my account. And now God accepts me just as he accepts his own son, Jesus It's like Jesus said to the Father these words. He no longer owes you a debt because I paid it fully on the cross. Receive him as you would receive me. Let him come into the family circle. I'll never forget as a 15-year-old who had grown up in church. And it's so good to have my mom with me this morning uh, and my wife and my daughter and son-in-law. But uh, there weren't many Sundays that I missed church because mom had me there. And uh, I, I knew the facts of the gospel. I knew the story. I knew the birth. I knew of the death. I knew of the resurrection. And when I was nine years old, I even got baptized. And I knew enough to convince everybody that I truly had trusted Christ because I had the right answers. But I didn't really understand the gospel. And one thing I did not understand was this concept that Jesus, when he died on the cross, he died for me. And he literally took the sins the wrongs, the things I had thought, the things I had said, the things I had done that were so offensive. And he took the nails for me, for my sin, for my punishment. And there was something that happened at the age of 15 when that truth settled in my heart that led me to the place that I wanted to give my life to this, to this person, to this, this Lord that that did that much for me. It wasn't a religious thing. It was a relationship. And that's what he's appealing to here. He's he's saying, I'm going to pay for this because Christ died for us. And then notice this third imperative, this, this admonition he gives to Philemon in verses 20 and 21. He says, refresh my heart in Christ. Verse 20, he goes on to write, yes, brother, Let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. And then I like this. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me. I I trust that through prayers, I shall be granted to you. Can you imagine this from Philemon's standpoint? He, um, he He sees a slave come back, Onesimus, and he's also got Archibus coming with him. And then he starts reading this letter, and he's saying, whoa, he's, he's asking me to forgive him. But he's not just asking me to forgive him. He's asking him to welcome him into my family. And, oh, by the way, he's going to come see me. <laughs> I'm going to be there shortly to see what happened. But notice what he's saying about how refreshing this is. Um, what does it mean to refresh? Well, it means to give rest. It's a word for relaxation. And this word that is used for refreshed here is the very same word that Matthew used when he recorded Jesus' words. In Matthew 11, a very familiar verse, verse 28, says, 
Jesus said to his disciples, Come to me, all you who are wearied and burdened, and I will give you rest. It's the same word. I will give you refreshment. Um, Philemon, you've been spiritually refreshed by Christ, and God's used you to refresh the hearts of others. And he's saying, now refresh my heart. And he could just be saying, refresh me. But remember what he said earlier when he said to Philemon that um, I have sent him back to you. And you, and this is verse 12. And you therefore receive him. That is what? My own heart. So as you refresh Philemon, you're refreshing me too. As you show him this acceptance... This is a very deep emotional term Paul's using. It's not the word cardia that we think of normally for heart. It's actually the word we use for a gut. It's phlegna. He's saying, man, Philemon, you have, the, you have the power here to touch Philemon and to touch me at a very, very deep level if you follow God's will in this situation, if you offer reconciliation. Have you ever been in a room or been in a situation when two people are at odds? They're not getting along. Maybe they're not speaking. Maybe you know a little bit of the backstory, and uh, there's been some really hurtful things said or hurtful things done. And it's tense, right? In fact, not only is it tense, many times it becomes very toxic because maybe one or both have been harboring unforgiveness and, and they had this bitterness. As Paul's saying, Yes, you could have bitterness. You could have anger towards this slave, this Onesimus has left you. But I'm asking you to relax this tense atmosphere by reconciling him and refreshing me. That's what forgiveness and reconciliation does. It's so refreshing. You see, it changes everything. For those in the room that are married, have you ever had a dispute, a fight, an argument, a disagreement with your uh, spouse. <laughs> this guy appears lying. Uh, let me put it this way. When you've had a fight or a disagreement or an argument with your spouse, what happens? It's tense, right? It's uncomfortable. It's painful sometimes. It's frustrating. It's, it can become toxic. It can become really, really bad. But especially for those marriages that are based in Jesus, when one spouse comes to the place of saying, humble themselves and saying, you know what, I was wrong when I said that. I was wrong the way I handled that. And perhaps the other spouse says, yes, and I was wrong for how I reacted to that. You know that feeling that comes at that point? When now you're back together, now there's oneness again? That's reconciliation. And isn't that so, so refreshing? I shared in the first service something I wasn't planning to share. Um, but I thought about the relationship between parents and children also. And sometimes, as a parent, you're at odds with a child. And sometimes, as a child, you're at odds with a parent. And that's common. And many times, those things are resolved quickly. But sometimes, the barrier is so big that it goes on and on, right? And, and it's so painful. It's so hurtful. And <clears throat> Chelsea's in the service and she's giving me permission to share this, but we had that relationship for a long time. And it was hard. It, it was hard for her. It was hard for us. We had certainly done things that were hurtful to her. She had done things that hurt us. But I'll never forget... <clears throat> the time she came to our living room and said, Mom and Dad, I need to ask you to forgive me. And it was so important to her. Not only did she ask us to forgive her, she had actually made a painting that recalled and illustrated what God was doing in her heart to bring her to that place that we could have a reconciled relationship. That's the power of the gospel. Because we didn't do anything to make that right. It was all God. It was all His work. It was all His grace. 
It was all his mercy. And there's some other things that we could say about this passage, but I want to just uh, ask you to think about maybe a little bit what you have in Jesus, what you've received, how much he loves you and how much he's given for you and how much he sacrificed for all of us. As Paul's writing to Onesimus, he, he, he tells him, Onesimus, remember every good thing which you have in Jesus. Because that's going to be the basis that Onesimus has to offer forgiveness and to reconcile, uh, Philemon has to reconcile Onesimus back into his life. I'll never forget the fall of October 2020. <clears throat> we all remember the year 2020. For many reasons, but all of us remember it for COVID, uh, the, the pain, the, the isolation, all that we went through with that. But as a church, uh, we also know that was a year we lost a pastor and uh, all that was associated with that. And having been at Moberly for nearly 28 years now, uh, there were so many blessings, but there was hurt. There was pain. And I had just come out of a period of depression uh, at the end of August. And God had really restored me, and, and it's just it's an amazing testimony. I'll, I could, maybe I could share that with you another time, but it was literally God's lifting me out of a pit that I could not get myself out of. But I'll never forget this October, fall afternoon, working in the yard. It was cool. The sun was out. Breeze was blowing. And I was riding my John Deere tractor, lawnmower. We have about a half an acre, and... I was just going back and forth, and I had earbuds in, and I was praising the Lord, and I was just recalling His goodness and all that He had done for me and just praising Him. And I remember at one point, I just took my hands off, and I just had them up like this as the lawnmower's going across the yard. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure the neighbors were like, that confirms it. He is crazy. Um, but I didn't really care, honestly. At that point, I was just kind of in the moment. And, and it was just a beautiful afternoon. I'd finished mowing, and now I was blowing off the driveways and stuff. And I'm gonna, I'll never forget, I remember exactly where I was standing on our driveway when not only did I feel the coolness of the wind, but I felt a wave of forgiveness and compassion it just flooded my heart, flooded my soul. And things that had been so painful to me, all of a sudden, there was freedom from that. And things that I felt hurt for, now I felt compassion for her. I didn't do that. But I'd have to believe because I had focused on all that God had done for me that he gave me the choice and the capacity to forgive some hurts that had occurred to me. And that's what Paul's appealing to Philemon here. So I ask you this morning, who might you need to forgive today? Whom do you need to be reconciled? Because the gospel can fix anything. Don't allow your heart to hold a person's sin over them when Christ has not held your sin over you. Martin Luther said, all of us are Onesimuses. And he's right, isn't he? The question this morning is, which Onesimus are you? Are you the Onesimus that has sinned and stand in need of forgiveness and reconciliation and you know you've offended the father or maybe a brother? Or are you the Onesimus who has experienced the forgiveness of Jesus and been restored to him and therefore also have the capacity to be restored to another that maybe has hurt you or maybe you've hurt. As we realize our forgiveness, we are able to forgive. Jesus' invitation to his disciples in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, I want to just extend to you. Jesus said to them, he says to us, come to me, all you who are 
laboring and you're heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Find refreshment. Find renewing as you come to Jesus. But notice he went on to say, I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I don't know what you're carrying today. I don't know what's happening with your family, close relationships. But what I do know is this. There's no situation too hard for our God. There's nothing beyond His reach. And we don't always see it immediately. But even in the midst of, of, of a of a a relationship that's not healed, you can still find rest and peace in your soul. I just finished reading a book by Les Carter. And the title is Enough About You, Let's Talk About Me. And it's a book about narcissism. And we won't get into what that means, but some of you may relate to a narcissist, a parent, a spouse, a boss, and a narcissist is basically a person that's so selfish that they don't care about you. They care about themselves. But you receive the pain of that. You receive the br- brunt of that. And we can't change a narcissist. God can. But how do we have peace even in the midst of that? Well, we can still grant forgiveness. May not be able to experience immediate reconciliation, but we can grant forgiveness. So I want to pray for you right now and for just God to have his will in your life, in my life, in our relationships. Father, I just thank you for the forgiveness. I thank you for the price you paid for us. I thank you, Lord, that not only are we forgiven, we are accepted. We are yours. We are your children. You love us. You value us. There's no shame. There's no rejection with you. And Father, I thank you that because of that, we can experience reconciliation in our relationships. And I pray that, God, you would bring healing today in hearts, in minds, to those who are experiencing the disruption, the pain of a broken relationship. I pray, God, for hope. I pray for courage. I pray for the ability to take the first step to reconcile a relationship that's broken. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.